Hi guys. Welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody's having a great day. Uh, before I get started on chapter 10, I just want to say thank you guys so much for all the wonderful emails that you're sending me. Um, I can't believe how much support I am getting from you guys. It's like, uh, I feel like you guys are a gift from above. I really, really do. Uh, it's not been a great time for me this last few months. And uh, I honestly, I don't know if I would have been able to keep doing this if you guys were not the wonderful people that you are. So from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Okay, so here we go. We all left at the same time. Scott and I took the Jeep and headed left out of the lane while Lisa, Kathy, and the kids went right. I wasn't thrilled that they were going by themselves in the pouring rain. After giving it some thought, I approached Lisa about postponing the shopping trip. She wanted to know why I changed my mind, and when I mentioned that I was afraid the weather might get worse, she just laughed at me. You know I'm a safe driver, Brad. I just don't like driving at night. You worry way too much. Just go and help Will, and we'll all meet back here for dinner, okay? I had to agree with her, but I wasn't too thrilled that Will pulled his favor today of all days. When we reached Will Johansson's place, Lola, Bonnie and Clyde's mother, came running over. She sniffed us and sniffed us and sniffed us some more. It was as if we had a pocket full of steak. Hello, Brad, over here, Will called from the barn. Lola Heel, he said in his heavy Swedish accent. Scott and I looked at each other, remembering Scott's experience with the dogs the night that we went grocery stop shopping. Lola sat down immediately and stayed. When we were almost at the doors, Will called out, Lola, come. Again, the command wasn't lost on us. Maybe all three dogs took obedience classes together wasn't impossible. Will let the dog in the barn and told her to go lie on her bed. He told us that Jenka won't let her in the house if she smells like a wet dog. He went on to explain that Lola was his dog and Jenka, his wife, had her own dog, a Bichon Freeze named Baby. Oh yeah, aren't they those cute little white dogs, Scott asked? Yes, yes, they are, Will answered. Jenka used to breed them but our male, Ruffles, was killed a year ago or so. Always running into the woods, then one day he just disappeared. We searched and searched. Poor Jenka still cries over him. It's so hard losing a pet, isn't it? I said. We all gotten really close to Bonnie and Clyde. I don't know what we would do if something happened to one of them. After a few seconds of respectful silence, Will resumed his chit-chatty mood which seemed very out of character for the will that I was getting to know, the quiet, somber will. But hey, I was getting to know the man. Maybe this was the real will, and the other one I met previously was in a bad mood or something. As he chatted about this and that, he motioned for us to follow him. We came to a large room with about ten cows inside. He explained that he thought his cow had an LDA and that the vet was on her way. Just then, before we could ask any questions, Rut and three other guys walked in. Introductions were made all around, and then Will told the newcomers that the cow probably had an LDA and would have to be rolled when the vet arrived. The other four guys seemed to take this in stride and nodded in agreement. When the vet arrived, she was a dowdy-looking lady in her early thirties, with long brown hair pulled into a ponytail and heavy black framed glasses. Will introduced her as Marianne Brown, who grew up just down the road. He called her a good old country girl and said if we ever needed a vet, to call Marianne. She turned out to be a no-nonsense type of girl, because she gave us a quick nod and went right to the ailing cow. She pulled a stethoscope out of her black bag and placed one end into her ears and with the other started moving it around the stomach as she thumped the area with her knuckles. She did this on both sides and said an LDL 
Can you get her over in that far corner, away from these other cows? We all looked in the direction she pointed to. Will wasted no time. He grabbed some rope from a hook on the wall, walked over to the cow and gently wrapped it around the cow's neck, crooning softly to the cow that he would get her fixed up quick. As soon as the rope was pulled taut, the cow turned and followed Will. He looked like he was leading a giant dog. Once they were in the corner, Rhett and his three buddies jumped to attention. They all seemed to know the procedure, while Scott and I stood there with our thumbs up our bums, waiting to be told what to do. Marianne came over and began explaining what needed to be done and why. The five other guys went about getting the cow to lie down by pulling the rope that was around her neck towards the back end, and as they did this, somehow unbalancing her, and she went down. Then Marianne started instructing each individual which position to take because she wanted the cow literally on its back with four feet in the air. We went over and tried to help with the pushing and the pulling as Marianne yelled for us to watch what we were doing and not to get kicked. Then she pulled out a needle that was shaped like a half moon and a suture kit out of her bag. She came over to the cow with her stethoscope again, listening and thumping. She looked up and smiled, plunged this huge needle into the cow's stomach and explained that she was tacking the stomach to the wall so it wouldn't become displaced again. And then it was over. Will walked the vet to the car, and when he came back in, he was soaked. The rain, he said, was coming down in buckets. He shook the water off like a dog and gave a hearty laugh. The whole time I was thinking of food, I realized I was starving and couldn't wait to leave. Well, Will... If you don't need us any more, I guess we'll be hitting the road as well, I said. Oh, yes, right. Well, I sure appreciate the help you boys gave, and you know you can always call me if you need a hand. Well, you've already proven that. I wish we could have been more of a help today, I said. It's definitely a job for a few strong men, that's for sure, he answered. Okay, well, we'll be getting going, I said waving and nodding at Rhett and the other guys. Then he shook both our hands and walked us to the barn doors. We ran the short distance to the jeep and jumped inside. As Scott was starting the jeep, he said, Hey, Brad, do you feel like some breakfast? I was a little surprised by his question. I laughed and I told him that I hadn't been able to concentrate because I was so busy thinking about bacon and eggs. If that doesn't answer your question, Scott, then I don't know what else to say, except, yes, I'm starving. What did you have in mind? Why don't we go to town and eat at Jackal Bee's? Kathy said the food is really good home cooking at its best. So we drove to town and had the most amazing breakfast. We were both stuffed. Scott leaned back in his seat and let out a silent belch as he rubbed his stomach. I could use a nap, man. I can barely keep my eyes open, he said, yawning. Me too. Maybe if we hurry home, we can get an hour or two before the girls get back, I said. Then all of a sudden, I remember I had to milk the goats. Shoot, Scott, we have to go. Lisa's going to be mad that they hadn't gotten milked, I said. Oh, okay, well, I'll help you get it done, he said. Just get me home before I fall asleep, I said, laughing. We kept to the speed limit while we were in town. The roads were wet and slick, and the rain hadn't let up. But once we left town, Scott sped up. He was still yawning and rubbing his stomach. See what happens when we eat like pigs, I said. Oh, never again. I'm seriously uncomfortable, Scott replied. I noticed he was unbuttoning his jeans for a little relief. And then all of a sudden he yelled, Oh, shoot! I looked up as the jeep went into a spin. Fear and panic were setting in and I braced my hands on the dash in front of me. The next thing I knew, I was waking up in the front seat of the jeep. I looked over at Scott and he was staring out the front window with his head cocked to the side. At first, I had a horrible fear go through me that he was dead. Then I noticed him blinking. Scott, are you all right? I asked. I think we've been in an accident. Yeah, I'm fine, 
but I feel kind of weird, he said. Me too, I agreed. I just happened to look at the digital clock on the dash and it read 1.14. Scott, that's not the right time, is it? I asked. Scott looked at the clock and then anxiously reached for his cell in his front pocket of his jeans. Yeah, Brad, it's uh, 1.15 by my cell. It can't be that late. They have to be wrong. We left at like 8.15 this morning. We were only at Johansson's for not even an hour, I said. Hang on, he said. I texted Kathy when we were leaving the diner. After what seemed like an eternity, Scott finally said, I texted Kathy at 10.58. Where have the last two hours gone, he asked, the look of fear crossing his face. Maybe we were unconscious all this time. It's possible, I said. Yeah, but what did we hit, Brad? There is nothing in front of us. He was right. The jeep was on the road with the engine running. But there was nothing in front of us that would have caused an accident. I could see he was starting to panic, so I tried to defuse the situation. Wait, I seem to remember an animal running in front of us, I said. So I got out of the jeep to see if there really was something in front of us that we couldn't see from inside the jeep. I was almost disappointed when I saw there was nothing on the road. I got back in the jeep and said, well, maybe it was lucky and survived. I looked over at Scott to see if he was accepting my answer for the loss of time when I noticed he was rubbing his hands all over his clothes. Then he started grabbing at my shirt. Hey there, buddy, what are you doing? I said, slightly uh, shocked by his aggression. Brad, why are our clothes so wet? He asked. I felt my clothes and they were quite wet. They must just be damp. I went to say something when the horn blasted us from behind. Oh, shoot. You better get moving. Let's talk about this at home, I said. I was glad to see that the girls hadn't come home yet. We needed time to figure out what had happened to us. How the heck did we lose two hours of our time? We were silent as we went into the living room. Uh, do you want a beer, Scott? I asked, but was quite surprised when he said no. Listen, I'm pretty sure we hit something. Probably a big buck but we both got napped out for a couple of hours. Doesn't seem that far-fetched to me, I said. Yeah, but we both woke up at the same time. Wouldn't you agree that's just a little weird? asked Scott. Yeah, it's weird, but not impossible. Plus, both of us were really tired, remember? I said. Okay, so how did our clothes get so wet? he asked. Just then, I remembered that there was a heavy downpour that we ran through when we left the diner. I mentioned it to Scott, and you could see his whole body relax as he thought back. That's right, he said. But you would think we would have dried off a little bit more in two hours. Yeah, but who's to say with the dampness outside and the rain, right? I'm sure there's a reasonable excuse for everything. We both hit our heads and we're not our normal selves yet. Try not to worry, Scott. Okay, Mom, he said, looking at me with a smirk on his face. I laughed. I was being overprotective. It became clear to me that Scott was more like a brother to me than a step-nephew. I was getting emotional, which wasn't exactly my nature, especially in, in front of friends. But it was as if I was losing all control. Brad, are you okay, buddy? Scott asked when he saw how shaken up I was getting. Yeah, I'm okay, I said as Scott sat down beside me, looking at me with concern on his face. It's just that uh, I kind of realized that I loved you like a brother, and it made me get all emotional, I explained. Ah, come on, come here, bro. Scott said as he pulled me in for a hug. Scott was a total hugger. Me, on the other hand, I'm a little uncomfortable hugging other guys. I guess we've been gone too long, Kathy. 
The guys have replaced us, said Lisa, as she dropped a bunch of bags on the kitchen table and came into the living room. Is everything okay, she asked, noticing that uh, I had been upset. Yeah, Scott answered. We were in a bit of an accident and can't account for a couple of hours. And Brad is just worrying over me like a big brother. What? yelled Kathy. You were in an accident? Are you okay? She said, grabbing Scott and looking him over. Lisa was doing the same thing to me, wanting every detail, and deciding that both of us were going to go to the hospital to get checked out. No, we're fine, I said, shooting a look at Scott. Two minutes. If only I had two minutes before Lisa came in, I would have said to Scott, what we probably shouldn't do is mention it to the girls. Clearly, Scott got the message because he looked at me with, I'm so sorry, written all over his face. Seriously, you two, we are fine, Scott argued. I have some medical training, you know, and I think you should go and get checked out, said Lisa. Lisa, you're a dental assistant, I said, laughing. As soon as it was out of my mouth, I knew I had made a big mistake. So I tried to cover it up by saying, which is why I love you so much, and I pulled her in for a hug. I felt her stiffen and then pull away. Well, whatever, she said. You guys are both big boys. You can make your own decisions. Lisa went into the kitchen and started sorting through the bags. My three daughters sat obediently at the table, watching their mother unload the bags into each pile. They knew instinctively that Lisa wasn't in the mood to be bothered. Brianna was the first to slip away and come in the living room to see how I was. She kissed me, then went back to the table. Then Jenny came and made sure I was okay. And then the last was Mandy, who crawled up on my lap and started playing with my fingers. As I was sitting there with Mandy on my lap, I remembered the goat still needed milking. I decided not to even mention it. I put Monsters, Inc. on for Mandy to watch, and I casually mentioned I was taking the dogs out. Once I was out of sight, I made a beeline for the barn. I got the goats milked in record time and went back into the dining room through the sliding glass doors. Lisa and Kathy were making dinner and laughing about something. Where were you? asked Lisa. The dogs came back ages ago. Oh yeah, I was just mucking around in the barn, I lied. You know, Brad, I could have gone and milked the goats myself. It would have taken half the time, she said, smiling. Hey, a deal's a deal, I said as I walked up behind her and wrapped my arms around her waist. What magic dish are you two creating tonight? Well, it doesn't really have a name yet, she giggled. So for now, it's a secret, Kathy chimed in. Okay, well, then, I said in a stupid accent, where did Scott go? Um, he's in the shower, Kathy said, preoccupied with the cookbook. I'm going to go lie on the couch with the manster, I said. Two little hands squeezed between Lisa and me, separating us. Dad, my name isn't Manster. It's Mandy. And can I have a cookie? I held a finger to my lips and snuck into the cookie jar on the counter opposite Lisa and Kathy. I grabbed two and gently replaced the lid. As Mandy and I snuck out of the kitchen with our cookies, I turned back and gave Lisa a smile and a wink. I laid down on the couch with Mandy in front of me, watching her favorite characters, Sully and Mike, the talking eyeball. I was more tired than I thought because I was out like a light. It seemed like I had only slept for seconds when Lisa woke me for dinner. I had the strangest dream. After dinner, Jenny and Brianna put on a fashion show of all the clothes that they bought that day. Lisa and I split up bedtime duties because Kathy and Scott were coming down to play cards. Normally, Mandy was in bed by 7, and because it was summer, we let the older two stay up till around 9.30. At 7.30, Lisa was tucking Mandy in, and I was busy bribing the other two with a bowl of chips, a couple of cans of pop, and a movie in exchange for some adult time. 
Jenny and Brianna jumped at the offer. Normally, they would have just gone up to their rooms early and watched their own TV. But I was still strangely out of sorts from the accident and the dream I had afterwards. Scott and Kathy were sitting at the table when we were done with the bedtime duty. Lisa sat down, and I went and grabbed the cards. What's the name of the game, I asked as I sat down at the table. Well, hang on a sec, said Kathy. Uh, Lisa, do you remember uh, Marianne Wilkes? Yeah, that's the lady who we got the jarred peaches from, right? Yes, uh, but they're called canned peaches, Kathy laughed. Anyway, she just called me, and she had made a bunch of pies for her church social on Sunday, and they just called her to say that it's been postponed. So she wants to know if we want a handful of pies. Of course, I told her, yes, we would take them, Kathy said. I was thinking because Gwen and Jerry are coming in a couple of days. We could probably eat a handful of pies, right? Oh, definitely, I said. I could go for some pie right now. Yeah, me too, said Scott. Lisa just smiled and licked her lips. Okay, good. I'm glad we could all go for pie because she needs us to pick them up tonight, Kathy said. So I took it upon myself to tell her, yes, we would come. I hope that's okay. Sure, said Lisa. You guys don't mind waiting a bit, do you? No, but do you want us to go or one of us? Meaning Scott and I, I asked. No, don't be silly, Lisa said. We'll go and be back shortly. Go watch TV or something. They left to go pick up the pies and I decided to tell Scott about the dream I had. I needed to get his opinion. So as soon as the girls were out the door, I said, Hey, Scott, remember that dream I had earlier today? Yeah, he said. Um, I'm feeling really strange about it. I can't stop thinking about it, and I kind of feel like I'm supposed to get something out of it. But I'm not really sure what. Do you want to tell me about it? Maybe I can help, Scott said. Okay, I appreciate it, but don't think I'm crazy, okay? Tell me about the dream, he laughed. Okay, don't interrupt, just let me tell it, and then you can ask me questions, okay? Okay, I'm listening. Okay. Raindrops were hitting me in the face. I can actually feel them. I strained to see and to comprehend what was going on. I remembered the spinning out of control. I think I remembered seeing the rear end of a deer running into the woods. Then I realized I was being pulled backwards out of the jeep. It was nose first in the ditch. I tried to tell you I was okay, but I must have lost consciousness again. When I came to for the second time, I was looking down at a very hairy rear end and legs. I was short of breath too, I thought I was dreaming in my dream, go figure, till I realized I was being carried over someone's shoulder. After about 15 seconds or so, I was set down under a tree out of the worst of the rain. I rubbed my eyes on the sleeve of my jacket because what stood in front of me made no sense at all. I had to be dreaming because what I was seeing was not possible. The long, hairy legs led up to a very hairy torso with large breasts, female breasts, which led to a very human-looking face that was mostly free of hair, except for the hair on her head. I leaned back against the tree and pulled my knees up to my chest. Then I covered my eyes with my hands. I just needed to rest a little longer. Then I felt a hand on my knee. When I looked up, I was fully expecting you to be there, but it wasn't you. The being, or creature, or whatever you want to call it, had kneeled down and was looking at me, face to face, and eye to eye. And then it spoke, but it didn't speak. It didn't move its mouth. I heard its soft voice in my head. I knew it was the creature who was communicating with me. I don't know how I knew it, I just did. In my head, I heard, you are safe now, and then I felt a gentle hand squeeze my knee. 
Then she reached up and put her hand on the side of my head. At the same time, I heard, Head, no hurting now, in broken English. And then I realized the headache and the fuzziness went away. I was completely alert, and all signs of pain were gone. That's when I thought about you. I looked around and noticed you were lying just behind the tree I was leaning against. I went to stand up to go check on you when I felt a pressure on my knee to keep me from standing up. Then again, I heard a voice in my head. Friend is good. He's sleeping. You stay, I fix. And with that, she stood up, turned, and walked to the ditch. It was when she stood behind the jeep that I realized how enormous she was. She towered over the top of the jeep by at least two feet, and in my estimation, that would make her over eight feet tall. She wasn't bulky like a bear. Her waist, chest, arms, and legs were extremely muscular in comparison, with a reddish blonde color hair all over her whole body. Her face was huge by human standards. Her mouth and lips were thick and full. Her nose was like a human's, except it was a little wider and flatter than most noses. Her eyes were jet black, and there didn't appear to be any whites around the irises. Her forehead was very narrow and receded slightly. Her brownish-blonde hair was very long on her head, and flowed down her shoulders and back and mingled with the hair growing on these parts. I was so in awe of what I was seeing that I didn't even realize what she was doing until it was done. She single-handedly pulled the jeep out of the ditch and placed it back on the road. Besides all the mud caked on the bumper from where we plowed into the ditch, the jeep didn't look damaged at all. In one step, she walked from one side of the ditch to the other. The ditch had to be a good five or six feet wide. Then she came back over to me again. She placed a foot on either side of my feet, then leaned down and placed her hands under my arms like I was a child, and then she lifted me until I was standing. She pointed to the jeep, and in my head I heard the words, Go! I thought to myself, what about Scott? What was she going to do to Scott? Again, I heard her voice. I bring him. I then realized what her intentions were. I turned to walk towards the jeep. She placed a hand, a very large hand, on my shoulder to stop me. She pointed to her chest, and I heard Riza. Oh, I said out loud. That's your name. And she smiled. Then I told her my name, Brad, without words. Again, she smiled and repeated, Brad. Then she gently pushed me in the direction of the jeep. I got in the passenger seat and closed the door. Riza walked up to the jeep carrying an unconscious you, like a newborn baby and she waited at the driver's side door for me to lean over and open it for her. She set you down gently and looked at me in the eye. She said to me, I'm happy that you see me now. I am not hurting you or your people, never. Then she placed a huge hand on your face for about five seconds, and then she reached over and touched my face too and then walked away across the road. I watched her walk away. I heard you wake up, and then it's over. I wake up and try to make sense of all of it. Wow, that's one detailed dream. Key word, Brad, is dream. I will say it sounds like an amazing dream, but I don't think you should be freaking out over it, said Scott. Freaking out over what? asked Lisa. You're back already? Scott and I both said at the same time, then laughed. We've been gone for over an hour. I thought you'd be ticked off, Lisa said, as her and Kathy sat down with a pie, plates, and forks. 
And that is the end of chapter 10. I hope everybody enjoyed their time with me, and I certainly enjoyed my time with you. So, guys, I think that's going to be it. I hope you had an amazing Sunday, and we'll see you back here in a day or two. Bye for now.